Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my presentation. Thanks for staying that long. Um, so my subject is software engineering, but software engineering that is applied to a very specific area of industrial automation. And uh, there are quite new trends uh, represented by buzzwords such as Internet of Things in the cyber physical systems. So these have very big influence on the future of industrial automation. So I combined all these buzzwords in, my, in the title of uh, um, my talk. And this is supposed to be a little joke, of course, because <laughs> um, the combination of everything. So what is industrial automation in a nutshell to give you a feel? What is it all about? So this video shows um, maybe one little example of automotive uh, manufacturing process. Um, you see uh, no people inside, no people around this car frame, which is you know, being fully operated, uh, fully conducted by robots. So all these machines are very tightly synchronized with each other in the follow some order of things, um, enabling this type of production. So, but obviously, behind this uh, exciting picture, there is something that controls the things. So, and what is a something is obviously a computer, right? So there are computers, and the computers are driven by software. So software is the soul of computers. So, uh, so this, what is a software? How does a software look like? For those who have little idea, I want to show you what is a software. It's a pretty boring thing. Right? So it's a collection of some commands, words. This is what programmers, the software developers, see on a regular basis. Uh, this is entities which the uh, software engineers operate with. So looking at this type of strange texts, uh, on a computer screen all day. And um, here is interesting thing about software. Uh, the ratio of software costs in the overall cost of automated machines or manufacturing systems has been constantly growing. And this graph is showing what is this ratio. Um, you see that uh, by the year 2000, it was already around 40%. And then together with electronics coming together to 60%. So if we try to extend this trend to see what is the future, what is the horizon 2020, uh, we, we, we may expect that uh, we will be over than 100% <laughs> in, in, in the costs of uh, software and uh, electronics in the automated uh, uh, manufacturing of all sorts of industrial systems. So whether or not this prediction uh, is going to happen, we see that there is a problem. Uh, if something close to this prediction is going to happen, then we all are going to become programmers and uh, facing these exciting uh, operators on screen in, in order to couple with the needs of humankind to develop all, all these uh, manufacturing automation systems. Um, to make things a little bit better organized, software engineers often speak and think in the way uh, like uh, constructors of buildings. Because the software is nothing else but another type of technical system. Uh, and uh, we talk about architecture in, in the software world, about building blocks, tools. We also, same as in the construction business, we observe chronicle overruns in costs and times of projects. Um, the users discover a lot of surprises after software is, has been commissioned. And so on and so forth. So we talk about maintenance, evolution, degradation. It's very, very similar. There arguably, they say that some software systems may be most complex creations of human beings, most complex technical creations, maybe uh, Microsoft Windows is more complex thing uh, than a space shuttle. If we had a metric that would allow to measure complexity of technical, uh, you know, different technical objects. So, uh, what is um, a state of the art in uh, uh, developing software for 
automation systems. Uh, we use very special types of computers called programmable logic controllers. They are connected to manufacturing systems. They collect in one point all the data being you know, generated, sensed, or uh, all types of signals. They travel through computer networks to these uh, controllers. Then the program is executed in those devices, and then uh, the signals commanding go back to the machines. Uh, so, it's not always been like that. Uh, it started uh, with, even before the computers appeared, already engineers automated machines. They used uh, hardwired devices such as relays, interconnected, as you see on the uh, slide in, in, on the left side. And just through this interconnection, they would encode into that some behavior algorithm. So that was done before uh, the computers. And then computers have arrived into this field around 1970s. So, so this programmable automation is approximately as old as I am. Uh, so I, I'm observing it through all my life, uh, uh, the, the history of programmable automation. It has grown into pyramid. It's almost like Egyptian pyramid. In, it's called ICT pyramid in automation, where on the low level we have uh, sensors and actuators, and on top level we have business logic. So that is the way how modern plants, highly automated modern plants, uh, are organized and operate. But um, the way how programmers in uh, automa industrial automation represent the programs always been different because of this legacy, because of this history, been different from what I've shown you, the sequence of operators. They've always been visual, mostly visual. So these are typical examples of programming languages used in industrial automation. And as you see, they all are types of diagrams. So diagrams can also represent the control logic in a, in, a, in a very efficient way. But they are better in the terms of understanding. Uh, so along with this big problem of avalanche of possible software needed in automation, we have another problem. You see that in the past, as Henry Ford used to say, there was enough to produce a product at good cost and good quality. So he said any customer can have a car painted any color that he wants, so long as it is black. And that was the motto of manufacturing for a long, long time. But the things have changed. People don't want any more mass products. They, they want different products. And this imposes huge challenges to uh, uh, manufacturers. So here is an example how these challenges were addressed in one research project in Italy when they tried to uh, develop a completely new model of manufacturing shoes. So the shoes which are completely um, individualized. So you, 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 you come to shoe store, you get your feet measured in the electronic scanner, then the data go to manufacturing plant, in this facility, they are cut and, and, and uh, fully created in this robotized, human-less facility, and the next day you receive the box uh, of shoes. So there's a new values in that, right? So these are hand of, sa of same quality as handmade shoes, and at the same price as now mass manufacturer. So having implemented that in a research project in Italy, uh, the engineers have seen that the way how the, these machines have to be programmed is much different from what is the case now. Why? Because uh, for every next pair of shoes, uh, there will be different flow of material. So they will travel through different passes across uh, different uh, manufacturing points. So that implies a lot more autonomy in the machines required. So each machine must become uh, autonomous, smart. So that makes all the developers you know, of, of, hard, of machines, of hardware and of software thinking modular like we used to do when we were kids or with the Lego blocks. So there, are, there is a new pyramid arising with very called smart devices, where even smallest 
sensor is actually self-contained unit that has internet connectivity. And assembling those devices into machines and then into manufacturing lines means that uh, we need to change the way how they program. There are no longer one big monolithic program is you know, applicable to, to the, this type of uh, Internet of Things structures. So the future plans will be collaboration of smart machines where they all will have some brains and they will talk to their neighbors and in some collaborative effort uh, will arrive to a uh, you know, new manufacturing uh, plan process. So this concept applicable to uh, manufacturing process technology in even control of electric grids. But inside those control nodes, what we will have is again, in, in the smaller form, the same pyramid which encapsulates all the functionalities uh, that we observe in the um, current ICT pyramid of automation. So here is an example how it was applied, uh, the state-of-the-art modularity technique was applied to, to this shoe manufacturing plant. As you see that uh, uh, th there are programming structures starting from very bottom, you know, ancient ladder logic diagrams and state machines and being encapsulated into modules and hierarchically going into high level where we have exactly six software components that correspond to six structures in the physical world. So there is a correspondence. The logic how we build software follows the logic how physical world is composed. And this probably is a clue how to overcome uh, this challenge of complexity. Otherwise, we would never be able to keep up uh, and uh, you know, go to along this curve of need of software. So uh, another uh, challenge in software business is the way how we test software. Classically, what software engineers do, they apply tests. So they, they, they have a number of input sequences and they measure what they see at the output. But this approach to testing does not really work in uh, cyber physical systems where the, the software is only the means to, to make the plant, the machine, working properly. So it's not enough for me to see that uh, the software generates certain outputs. I, I need to see that machines work in a proper way. So for that, we need to somehow deal with models of machines because it's too expensive to break down real machines. Or maybe they don't exist when we start this uh, testing of software. So, we develop in our research work the concept of cyber physical components uh, th uh, th that um, combine in each small component a little bit of control logic and a little bit of machine's behavior. So, so that these components, they pre-created by developers of machines and once uh, they ship the machines, the users can also combine the software components into structures. So this solves the problem of uh, complexity, not only of design, but also of testing. So in a system like, for example, conveyor system, adding a new component mechanically may mean that we just mechanically add software component. So we applied this type of automatic generation of software based on physical structures in a number of studies related to building automation, airport baggage handling systems, manufacturing systems, and, and smart grid. So for example, in the, um, airport baggage handling, we start with uh, drawing of layout of the airport in the computer-aided design tool. And from there, we derive basic objects, which are conveyor sections. And for this, we take library el software elements and connect them in a certain order. So that solves the problem of uh, designing such large software systems. So here you see an another interesting um, consequence of this approach. Uh, the software system designed in this way become inherently robust. You see, we, we simulated here breakdown of one conveyor section over here. And you saw that uh, the black the, the, the bag which is marked with a black exit 
avoided it automatically. So we, did, we simulated it by just disconnecting the microcontroller from the network. So meaning that without, with zero effort, the system becomes reactive on any type of faults which may occur and automatically on the fly will reconfigure material flows. So the very same approach can be applied in different sectors of applications, like for example, smart grid. So smart grid in a way is similar to this creature, which is a B2 bomber. And uh, I, tell you, I tell you why it is similar. I don't want to make a quiz. <laughs> it's, in, in my view, it's similar because uh, this creature cannot fly. Although you see it's flying, but aerodynamically, it's unstable thing. It wouldn't be able to fly if it was not equipped with very sophisticated control system. So if you cut down the power, it will immediately drop down as a brick. So smart grid, which is a combination of two major things, one of which is integration of renewable generation, and another is robustness, ability actively fight with blackouts. So these two, two, two main features of smart grid are only achievable if it is uh, equipped with uh, artificial, let's say, neural network that connects control systems of local devices, of generators, of active loads into such a constantly exchanging information network that can react in real time on changing balance of, of generation to consumption or uh, created uh, you know, some faults, stop propagation of faults. And uh, this, by opinion of many researchers, is only achievable with a distributed control. So with the Internet of Things approach where every single device, every single generator uh, is equipped with uh, little own brains. So, in, um, to conclude, in the software engineering, we often, uh, we did a lot of things being motivated by uh, architecture, inspired by such structures as bricks, and trying to create software in a similar uh, modular uh, way. But now, um, this mechatronic revolution brings a new type of motivation and new type of structures which are created by human and which already have embedded brains inside, but they show new physical uh, qualities. So I want to show you this quite famous invention or uh, development, it's more joke developed at MIT, of uh, smart blocks that can form structures on their own. So they just, each of the bricks is jumping is completely independent from others, has some embedded microcontroller in it. So for me, this example gives extra sort of motivation to think about new software structures that also self-configurable and self-composable into large software systems. So I'm very excited to be here at Alta and to be able to do this type of research. Thank you very much.